to ACF Chefs Forum. We appreciate all of you tuning in today for this exciting webinar. Now, more than ever, and especially during this difficult time, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to have Modernist Cuisine here with more information just for you, the leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a know, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose questions to our guest chef. Let's get the discussion going on the chat by telling us where you're tuning in from today. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I am honored to introduce our guest chef today for this once in a lifetime opportunity to tour the Modernist Cuisine Lab. So please join me in welcoming Chef Francisco Magoya and the Modernist Cuisine team for an inside look of their state-of-the-art test kitchen. Chef Magoya has a wealth of experience, including have been, having been the executive pastry chef for the French Laundry, a chef instructor at the Culinary Institute of America, written three pastry books, and owned his own chocolate shop in New York's Hudson Valley. He is head chef at Modernist Cuisine and co-author of the James Beard award-winning Modernist Bread and the forthcoming Modernist Pizza. Thank you for joining us today, Chef. And at this time, I'll pass the presentation over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jackie. Well, uh, welcome to the Modernist Cuisine Kitchen. My name is Francisco Migoya, and I'm going to give you a tour of uh, what we have here, most notably the equipment that might be a little bit unusual, maybe not, you know, in every kitchen, uh, because what we have here is, uh, it's not just a professional kitchen environment. What we have is also, think of it as a combination of kitchen and lab. Uh, why? Because we write books, we write really big books, we write books that are really almost completely based on science and the metrics that science provide. And so we have instruments to measure those metrics and to provide us information that we then pass on to you in our books. Uh, so see it as a, for example, our bread book is probably the only bread book you'll ever need. Our pizza book, same thing, because we're providing you more than our opinion on things. We're providing you with really cold, hard facts. Um, and so that's what we strive to do every day. That's really why our books take four or five years uh, for completing. Um, it's very exciting. It's something that, you know, I look forward to every day. This kitchen, it's beautiful. I, I don't get tired of coming to it. Uh, even, you know, Sunday evenings, I'm not dreading Monday mornings because this is just such an amazing uh, place to work. So uh, on that note, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start our tour. And if you'll uh, come with me this way, um, we're for, first going to look at our uh, rather large uh, freeze dryer. So a freeze dryer is a machine that it almost sounds like a you know, contradiction in terms. How can you dry something by freezing it? So if you've ever had like astronaut ice cream or if you ever had like seen or had freeze dried fruit or any ingredient like that, a machine like this is what is utilized to do that. So the way it works is basically whatever we want to freeze dry is uh, frozen beforehand. We have a deep freezer, we set it in there. It's at about minus hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And then we put it inside this machine. This machine is also set at that temperature. The numbers that you see up here are in Celsius. So I'm gonna to try to do in Fahrenheit. I think more people are familiar with that. Um, so uh, what we do is we put it in here, set it to that temperature. And every 12 hours, we increase the temperature. We increase the temperature and what occurs is that even if you increase from minus 100 to minus 90, there's a temperature differential that creates condensation, basically it pulls water from the inside of the food out to the surface. So what the machine does with that condensation is basically it takes that moisture and it pulls it out. It has a very powerful vacuum. If you see here, and I'm gonna open the door, this is a, a rubber gasket. This is a very thick door, as you can see. When I close it and I turn the pump on, it pulls a vacuum on here. So as it's freezing and we're increasing the temperature every 12 hours, 10 degrees or so, it depends on the food we're doing. The denser foods take longer, the less dense foods less time because there's less water in them. Uh, after let's say like 10 days, what we're gonna have is a food that is completely moisture free. Uh, it's gonna be crunchy, but it's still gonna have all those parts of it that have the, that raw taste to it. So if you have strawberries, for example, you have that raw strawberry taste uh, without the moisture, okay? Here, we have something very interesting uh, that we uh, use in our bread book. 
which we utilize this not as a recipe per se, but to illustrate what a fermented dough looks like on the inside. Now, some books have tried to do this by basically taking a fermented dough, freezing it, and then cutting it. What happens is bread, really dough, is a very good insulator. So by the time the core of that fermented dough freezes, it may have overproofed. So what we did with our fermented dough is we put it in, the, in a blast freezer, actually in the deep freezer, again, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it got frozen within 10 or 15 minutes, and then we put it in this machine. And so after about two weeks, we were finally able to pull it out. And what we have uh, to illustrate here is what it looks like on the inside. What, what do those nooks and crannies, those um, alveoli that uh, the yeast and lactic acid bacteria produce, what does it look like? Um, so this is the result. It also made for a really cool picture, but that's beside the point. So other foods that we have freeze-dried, I mean, any food that has moisture in it, you can literally freeze-dry. So for example, here, we have a margarita pizza that we freeze dried. So we freeze dry it, uh, it's fully baked, we put it in the freeze dryer. And the purpose of this was to then pulverize it. So this is margarita pizza uh, powder. And then we mix this into a dough to make another pizza. So it's kind of like a meta pizza, if you will. Now, a lot of our recipes are written for normal kitchens, but some have this, because I think that's kind of the expectation of what we have here. So it's an aspirational recipe, if you will. It's something that might give you an idea or, or, or it might set off another set of, of ideas that you might wanna do, uh, or it may, might make you wanna buy a freeze dryer. And those, that's entirely uh, doable. So uh, this is more or less the things that we do here. And here, see, for example, these are freeze dried tomatoes. Um, I did these, these are cherry tomatoes, obviously. These were red, they lost some of their pig pigmentation when they dried. Uh, but this, for example, if we pulverize it and we add it to a tomato sauce, it makes it even more flavorful. Uh, and it's adding a flavor of raw tomatoes, which you don't really get in the tomato sauce. So uh, many purposes can be found for this particular machine. I mentioned early our photography uh, and our books are kind of known for the photography um, because they're, they're just, to me, they're just beautiful, beautiful pictures. Um, and some of them are taken by our founder, Nathan Merrill, but some of them are taken by our photographers. And this is our main studio here. It's very convenient because we have a studio right off the kitchen. So whatever is ready to go, like let's say a pizza it looks beautiful when it comes out of the oven, we go straight from the oven to here. And this is where it's photographed. It is a kind of like a modular space, meaning like this space was, uh, can be changed and moved around for different environments. So for our bread book, it looked like a sort of like a bakery. We had a rack with bread on it. Uh, right now it's in transition. We, Previous to this, we, we had it looking like a pizzeria kitchen, more or less, very simple though, not no stereotypes or any of that stuff, no like hanging chilies and garlic and whatnot. It was just like a white wall uh, and that was about it. Uh, and so next we're writing our uh, book on pastry. And so we're trying to look at what, what it's gonna look like. We still haven't decided what it's gonna look like. We still haven't even decided what's gonna be in the book yet, uh, but that's what we're working on next, okay? So this is where all the photography happens. We took about a half a million photographs for our bread book took about, and that's not an exaggeration, I'm just saying half a million. It was probably even a little bit more. Um, and from there, we kept about, in our book, there's about 6,700 pictures. Uh, our pizza book, not quite half a million, but pretty close. Um, and you know, that it's just, it's, it's, it's important to tell a story with pictures and the better the pictures are, the more attractive our project is. So let's move on into the main kitchen. So over here, uh, this is called a rotary evaporator. And uh, I can, you can tell why it's called a rotary because it rotates. Uh, but this is a, basically a machine that we utilize. It has many purposes, but one of the purposes is extraction of flavor, right? Uh, another purpose is if you wanted to make like, uh, you know, gin or if you wanted to make, whis make whiskey or whatnot, it could also function as a still. Uh, but we use it, for example, what I have in here is something that I enjoy tremendously, which is the taste of, it's a concentrated taste of fresh, ripe tomatoes. And the reason why we do this here is because you don't always have tomatoes that are at that stage. You don't always have, you know, fresh, ripe tomatoes. It's not always August. It's not always like in peak season. So the rest of the year, you're stuck with like not very good tomatoes. Uh, and I, I, like I said earlier, I really like the, the taste of, of those, you know, raw tomatoes. And I wanted to apply that to a pizza. Um, and so the idea was to put, you know, 
just, these are regular plum tomatoes in here. Uh, we've removed the seeds and we just crushed them and we put them in here. And let me show you how, how the machine works. So inside here, we have the crushed tomatoes. And then in this bowl, you can see there's water and a coil. And so the coil basically warms the water up. And what I do is then I bring this all the way up so that the bottom of the bowl, of the spinning bowl, is going to be in contact with the water. Okay. So if you look at the controls that I have here, I have a control over how fast it spins. So right now it's between 18 and 19 RPMs. So that's revolutions per minute. And then we have a bath temperature, which is the water. It's in Celsius right now. It's 26 degrees, which is about 78 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just warm. So what I'm trying to do is, uh, when this machine is running, there are two pumps that are gonna be activated. One is a pump that is gonna pull a vacuum inside the rotating bulb. And then there's another pump that's gonna be basically uh, pushing a coolant liquid through these coils up here. You can see there's this glass coil that goes up. So a coolant liquid goes through it. So what occurs when you create this sort of vacuum in the bulb is that you're able to precipitate liquids. And when I say precipitate, think of um, the term like boiling, but without heat. So imagine what that is. Imagine if something's bubbling, but there's no heat applied. That bubbling and that vacuum, what it's gonna do is it's gonna basically uh, create these like micro droplets of water that are gonna be sucked out of the bowl. And that's water, that's just, that's, that's the part of the tomato that has no flavor, right? So what we're leaving behind in here is all of that concentrated tomato, the sugar, and all of those parts of the tomato that are tasty. And the water is gonna come out through here. You can see it condensing here on the neck of the bulb but you can see it happening even more up here and then even more so up here because in this coil with the coolant liquid, those beads of water are gonna coalesce and become larger and then they're gonna drop down through here and then come out on this other side on this bowl here. So what we have in this bowl here is just, it's plain water. It has a little bit of tomato taste, but it almost, it's not very good. Uh, it's not, you know, like you, when you make traditional tomato water where you you know, brine tomatoes, hang them in cheesecloth, let it drip overnight. That is very flavorful and it's, it's, it's delicious, but this tomato water is not very good. So we don't use this, what we use is this. So how do we use it if it's got that raw taste? We bake the pizza and then we put the sauce on top once it comes out of the oven. So you have that, that flavor combination that I really enjoy. In fact, sometimes what we do is we bake pizza with regular cooked sauce, cheese and so forth. But then when it comes out of the oven, we make like small canals put it on top of the pizza with this raw sauce and it's delicious. And you can see here, it's just a very thick tomato sauce that we just like to slather on. And this is like the essence of the tomato. It's just this like super concentrated tomato taste. And we're in the middle of April where tomatoes aren't really good right now, but this is actually delicious at this point. So this is one of our other big pieces of equipment here. So if we go over here, uh, this, by the way, is Kimberly Schlafe. She is our uh, food science assistant, uh, and she's going to assist me with showing you how this machine works. So this machine in its first life was, as it says here, a texture analyzer. Um, the way it works is this. This is, think of it as a robotic finger that goes up and down, and that's exactly what it is. It doesn't look like a robot, but it's a robotic mechanism that is basically moving the finger up and down. And so uh, what it does is through the, through the computer, we tell it how hard to push up and down. So if I have a, let's say a slice of bread um, and we're trying to you know, determine an experiment on you know, staling and you know, adding ingredients that delay staling uh, you know, and how long it takes bread to stale, I'm gonna tell the machine, okay, utilize a pound of pressure on all these loaves. And so it does it. And the moment it ruptures through the surface, it stops. So it can tell us how much uh, how much it had to apply that pressure for before it ruptured the surface. So a bread that is stale will be harder and a bread that is not stale will be softer. And so we'll be able to tell whether our experiment ingredient was successful or not, for example. And so we're done with our bread book. And so we were able to basically readapt this machine for a different purpose, utilizing the same mechanism of the arm going up and down. Uh, and so we have a big machine shop. You can't see it here, but right next to our kitchen is a massive, uh, machine shop. It's like five times bigger than this kitchen, probably more. It's like a, almost like a football field size. Um, and so they have a bunch of different machines and a bunch of technicians there that help us out all the time. And so basically they designed a 
this adaptation to the machine, which is uh, basically what we use this machine now is for something that's called an extensile graph. So an extensile graph is something that's gonna measure the extensibility of something like a rubber band. Uh, but in this case, what we're measuring is the extensibility of dough. And let's say, for example, we're testing out the extensibility of a particular type of flour for a particular type of pizza. Let's say double O flour for a Neapolitan pizza. So which brand of all the brands of double O flour has the most extensibility? And when I say extensibility, I want you to think of something that can stretch and yield at the same time without snapping or being very hard to do. So ideally, a very good double O pizza dough you'll be able to easily stretch and it won't fall apart. It won't be very hard to do, so you're not ripping and tearing at it. So it's a combination of tenacity and elasticity, okay? So here, uh, if, if you come closer, and show you what we have here. So this is a two metal plaques, and you can see all the grooves that we have here. So what these plaques do is we'll put a, a piece of dough here, push it down, squeeze real hard, trim the sides, and what that's gonna give us is 12 very similar in size strips of dough. We have already done it here. Sometimes it comes out the side, so we just kind of cut it off. Okay, so you can see here, we have our 12 strips of dough, okay? So what I'm going to do then is I'm gonna take this strip of dough and I'm gonna put it right here. You can see this closes, and then this hook here is gonna pull the dough up. So I'm gonna take a piece of dough. You have a strip here. Put it down, close it up. And now the computer is gonna tell it to start pulling up. And you're gonna see at one point, it's gonna start stretching and you can see the computer, how the graph is going up higher and higher. And at the moment it breaks, it stops, okay? So what we do is we repeat this nine more times. We have 12 strips of dough, just in case there's one or two that don't work out very well. But then what we do is we wanna make sure that we have accurate information. So we do this 10 times with the same dough. And then once this is done, what we're gonna do is we're gonna average out those numbers. And it's gonna tell us in reality, what is the average extensibility of this particular dough. And then we do this with other doughs, we do it with other flours and we can compare them all and tell you, look, this is the best flour you could use to make pizza dough, period. Now, after that, you would say, well, but what does it taste like? We don't, we delve a little bit in the whole sensory part, meaning if it's something that tastes good, we will recommend it. If it's something that doesn't taste good, we won't really say it's terrible, but really, something that is good to eat is completely personal. So we, we try to not do that. It's kind of called soft science, which means that it's not hard science. It's not something, you know, even people don't universally like chocolate. There's some people who don't like chocolate, but it's, and it's not for us to say, you know, you should like chocolate. It's for us to say, this is a flower that's gonna accomplish the most successful results. And whether you like it or not, that, that is a completely personal. And it's a decision that we leave up to you, okay? So, uh, over here, we have another, thank you, Kim. Uh, we have another really cool machine, if you wanna come on this side. Uh, this is, it looks like a, like a washer, right? Like a clothes washer machine. Uh, and that's because it works very similarly. If you think of how a clothes washing machine works, it's basically a barrel that spins, right? So when the wash is done, it starts to spin very fast. So I can squeeze that centrifugal force is gonna squeeze the water out of the, the clothes so that they're dry, well, not drier, but they have less water in them and they're easier to dry. So this is similar in that regard. This is a, an ultra centrifuge machine. It's called ultra centrifuge and not just centrifuge because an ultra centrifuge also has the ability to refrigerate, keep things cold. And that's important. It's important because what we're spinning in here, it's spinning at 10,000 RPMs. That's 10,000 spins per minute. Um, and that creates a lot of friction because there's a lot of movement. Uh, that sort of centrifugal force is, it can be also explained as it's applying 30,000 Gs of force onto whatever we're spinning in. Uh, 30,000 Gs of force, that is one G of force is the gravity that basically keeps us from flying out of the planet, keeps us on the ground. That's one measure of unit. 
30,000 times that, imagine what sort of pressure that's exerting on the food or ingredient that we put in here. So there's a few applications for this machine. One is experimental and the other is for actually making food. So in the experimental part, what we did is we centrifuged a mixture of flour and water. Uh, and we were testing the absorption of water from different types of flour. So for example, how much does bread flour, like white bread flour absorb versus whole wheat flour versus rye flour? And so for example, the white flour is the one that absorbs the least amount of water, uh, whole wheat a little bit more because bran and germ are what are called water loving. So they, they, they absorb a little more water. And then we have a completely uh, incredible rye flour, which absorbs up to 16 times its weight in flour. And even after one hour at 10,000 RPMs, it didn't let go of a single drop of water. But this helps illustrate, like if you've ever had rye bread, why is it so dense? Why does it have such a long shelf life? And it's because of that water retention, okay? So uh, let me show you in here what we have. And it, looking at it might explain it a little bit better. So this is a barrel. This is where, this is what is gonna be spinning. It's very cold in here. It's in refrigeration temperatures. And what we have in here are beakers. And these are beakers that we fill with either the water and flour mixture, or in this case, this is a green pea puree. Look at how green it is. So this is what it looks like before we centrifuge, right? So this is what it would look like when it goes in and it's just the pea puree. And what does the centrifuge do when it's spinning that quickly? What it's gonna do is it's gonna separate the components of the pea puree in the different density. So the heaviest, the most dense element will be all the way at the bottom and the lightest will be all the way on top, okay? So note also that when I put these in here, I'm also gonna put them well balanced. They're front to front. I would never put it asymmetrical. I would never put it right here instead of here, mostly because if this goes out of balance, this literally could be a bomb, okay? And it could make uh, a lot of damage and hurt some people. So after one hour at 10,000 RPMs, what we have is this. So it's basically to split the P. I've never thought of it in those terms, split P. Uh, but it's basically broken it down into the different densities. You can see all the way at the bottom here. This is the starch, okay? So this is what, when you eat peas, would have, it has that like starchy texture, that, that mealiness to it, even once they're cooked. Uh, this liquid here is the pea juice. And this is incredibly flavorful. It's, it's just it's like the most refreshing, one of the most refreshing liquids ever. And it's delicious. It has a concentrated pea taste. But what we really, 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 really like, and I hope you can see it, is this very thin line between the juice and the starch. And you can see it's just slightly a different green. And that's what we call a pea butter. And of course there is no fat in pea. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no fat. What it is, is this is basically the sugars that are in the pea. Um, and some of the other components uh, that are in the pea, but it's a very thin layer and it's just absolutely delicious. It has none of that starchiness, it has a concentrated pea taste and the texture in the mouth is like soft room temperature butter. Uh, so we use this uh, not for any pizzas, not for any breads, but sometimes we have dinner events here at the lab, you know, groups of anywhere from eight to 40 people. It's basically Nathan Mirabel, our boss, puts these dinners together for, you know, his uh, for different chefs or sometimes for his uh, family and so on and so forth. So we don't do it very often, especially this past year with COVID, we haven't done it in a while. The point is this is the sort of food that is in our, in our savory book uh, and also some of the food that we serve here at the lab for special events. Okay, so now let's go to another area here. So this is Evan Herman. Uh, Evan Herman has worked with us, you know, for most of the books, our book projects. Uh, he does a lot of work on the computer. His job is basically uh, to take all of the books we have, take that information, take those recipes and input them all in a huge database manually. He literally pl plugs in every recipe in this huge database. Uh, he did all of that for the bread book. He did all of that for a pizza book. And now we're looking at more efficient ways of actually doing, you know, reading recipes electronically without him having to physically input every recipe. But that database gives us a lot of information. For example, we'll be able to tell you, uh, you know, in most, uh, for example, baguette recipes, what is the proportion that most bakers use? How much flour, how much water, how much salt? Uh, and then the same for pizzas, what's the most popular topping? Um, what is the most popular type of pizza? You know, these are questions that we can ask, 
the uh, the database once we know where the information is and, and how to find it. Okay, so that's most of his job, but he also works here in the kitchen. A lot of people that work here, they are cross disciplinary, meaning they can do many different things, not just what they are they were hired to do. Uh, but that's kind of like the, the cool part of working here. So anyway, what Evan also helps us do is he helps us with our scanning, our 3D scanning. Why do we do 3D scanning? We do 3D scanning because it is the most accurate way to measure the volume of anything. Now, if you think of a cube or a sphere, uh, these are pretty easy to measure the volume because they have very straight lines, right? But if you have something very organic, like a pizza or a loaf of bread, it's very different to measure volume. And there's other methods to do it. They're very cumbersome. They take a lot of time. This is a lot better because this is a 3D scanner. So he's gonna show you what he's doing. I'm gonna to explain to you because you can't hear him. Uh, but if you come closer, you can see what we have here is obviously a pizza, but this is the actual scanner. So the scanner is gonna go up and down and it's basically taking a top down photo of the pizza. And once it takes that picture, what it's going to do is it's going to start, uh, we're gonna spin it the camera's gonna stay in place and now it's taking a 360 degree photo of the actual pizza, okay? Uh, and once that happens, we're gonna have a 3D rendering of the pizza and Evan is gonna show us what that looks like. So you can see here, once it's scanned it, we have a 3D image of it and he can move it up and down and so on and so forth. The image is almost irrelevant at this point where we need, what we get from this is a very important number. You can just point at it, Evan. Uh, so that number is just giving us to the millimeter what the volume of this pizza is. So why is it important to measure the volume of a pizza? Uh, let's say we're testing different hydration, meaning how much water we're we putting into the dough, different fermentation times, different fermentation temperatures. Volume does give us a lot of answers. And I'm, I don't always say volume as like, you want more volume as the best thing you could do. It's not always ideal, if I'm, especially if I'm, Think of like a thin crust pizza, why would I want any volume, right? Um, and so, but if I'm thinking of like, I wanna do a, like a high hydration, you know, Neapolitan pizza with a big puffy crust, then hydration plays a better role, uh, a more important role in that, in that, um, uh, in that uh, result. So once we have this, you know, it, if we're testing in this case, you know, baking time, for example, we will bake three pizzas exactly the same Evan will scan all of them, and then we get the average metrics from that pizza, and we're able to compare apples to apples in this case. So a uh, very important aspect of what he does here is just gathering all the data. So he's like our data guy, okay? Uh, so anyway, this is, this is just one of the ways that we measure the metrics here. So thanks, Evan. Uh, so this is a, a little like chocolate corner, if you will. I did own a chocolate shop a long time ago, and I did bring some of my machinery with me. It's kind of like cars. Uh, if you buy a car and you sell it, it's going to depreciate really quickly. Same thing with machinery like this. Uh, it's better to transport it than to sell it. You're always going to lose money. So uh, this is a panner. So if you've ever had like M&Ms or chocolate coated almonds, this is the machine that is used for that. It basically spins as you add chocolate to it. This is a chocolate tempering machine. Uh, often people ask me, what is your favorite method of tempering? And this is it. It requires pressing a single button. That's my favorite way to temper chocolate. Uh, I press that button and in five minutes, I have 12 kilos of, of tempered chocolate. So it's a great machine to have. And then we just have other chocolate miscellany here, but this is kind of like the, the confectionery corner, if you will. So moving on, uh, we're gonna go to, we're going to the ultrasonic uh, bath. Okay, so this is an ultrasonic bath, okay? An ultrasonic bath is a uh, machine that is utilized mostly in jewelry stores uh, because the way it works is it will, it basically, if you look in here, this is filled with water. And what we have is the water, uh, the machine, it basically pulses these ultrasonic uh, waves through the water. Uh, they're really high power. They're so high powered that if I put like this, you can see it very clearly here, it, it ruptures right through the foil. And it's utilized in jewelry shops because if I put, let's say, a silver necklace in there and it's tarnished, put it in here, the ultrasonic waves are going to be able to basically uh, get rid of it 
okay? It just basically, it, it, it knocks them right off, okay? It's that powerful. But aluminum is a thin metal, so it, it makes a hole right through it. But what do we use it for then? Uh, we use it, I don't think we've ever used it for cleaning, actually. We use it for uh, making what I think is the best French fry that has ever existed, okay? Uh, so, let's see. In here, these are potatoes, okay? So these are potatoes that have been cut to the same size. Uh, currently they're in a brine, salt water brine. They have been cooked in a uh, combi oven just until they're just cooked. Um, and once this happens, uh, we put them inside this machine. So the reason why we put it in this machine is because what it's going to do to the surface is what it would do to like, for example, this to a lesser degree. It's gonna rupture the surface of the, the potato. Uh, by doing that, it's gonna create, let's imagine like a fuzzier surface. So if it was flat, once the surface is ruptured, it's gonna be a little bit more like mountainous, a little fuzzier. And why is that good? It's good because it gives us more surface area. So if it gives us more surface area, it's more surface area that can fry and get crispy. So once we drop it in the fryer, that outside is frying, getting crispy while the inside stays nice and creamy. So what we get, you can see it here. You can see a very fuzzy looking French fry that is really crunchy and crispy on the outside. And the inside is really soft, creamy and tender. Okay, so to me, I mean, I love most French fries, but when they're soggy, they're terrible. Uh, but the crispier they are and the longer they stay crispy, the better. So this is just an incredible way to make French fries. Okay, so here's another machine. Uh, so this, think of this as a stick blender, but a lot more powerful. Okay, so a stick blender, I don't know exactly what, how fast it spins, but I can tell you that this one can spin up to 18,000 RPMs. That is really fast. Uh, I don't think we've ever used it at 18,000 RPMs because it's overkill, but a stick blender has a wand, right? It has a wand and it has a blade. So if you're making whatever you're making, it either breaks it down or you can also make emulsions with that. Uh, if you're making a vinaigrette, for example, or a ganache, it's very good for that purpose. But this accomplishes that a lot more efficient. And it's called a rotostator homogenizer putting emphasis on there so that you understand uh, why it's called that. It, it's called that because it has a rotary part, which is here, roto, that's the roto part. You'll see here, spins. And then stator, this has this static part right here. So this part won't be moving while this is spinning very fast. If you see the distance between the rotary part and the static part, it's very small. But as this is spinning, what it's doing is it's creating these micro droplets that are basically going to disperse into another liquid. So if we're making a vinaigrette, for example, it's gonna take the vinegar, pass it through here, and basically push it out in micro droplets into the oil. So it's gonna create that suspension, which is what an emulsion is. So here we have a pretty good example of that. Uh, what we have in this beaker is a, you know, the composition of vinaigrette. So it's balsamic vinegar and oil on top. I'm gonna to turn it on. And you can see how it starts to basically push those, make those little micro droplets, throwing them into the oil. It's really cool because you can see it almost in real time. And after a minute or so, what you're gonna have is completely emulsified vinaigrette, okay? So you can also like move it around if you want to, it doesn't have to like stay put, uh, depending on, on what sort of uh, patience you're dealing with here. But we're gonna have, uh, by the time this is done, you're gonna have a really good emulsion. So this is, a, this is really used more in lab uh, environments. It's not really a kitchen tool, but we've readapted a lot of that lab stuff to be able to work in, in kitchens, okay? So we're not gonna wait a minute for that to happen. Just believe me that it does emulsify completely in about a minute. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is a quick pizza demo because why not? So I'm gonna do a Neapolitan pizza demo. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite pizzas, although I don't think I, I have a, a not 
a, a pizza I don't like. Maybe there's a couple of styles that I'm not a huge fan of, but I'll eat any pizza. Uh, but Neapolitan, I love because it's technically, uh, there's a lot going on. It's, uh, there's, there's uh, just like the enormous pleasure of when your first Neapolitan pizza comes out, it's just a joy. And then, you know, continuing to do it consistently is also to me uh, a joy. So uh, I'm gonna show you just very quickly how we do it. I'm not gonna give you a recipe for our dough, but this is our master dough recipe. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, Neapolitan pizza has a lot of water. It doesn't. Actually, it's very low in hydration. It's anywhere between 60 and 65% hydration. Uh, what gives us the big bubbles, the big pockets is the steam that is produced within the dough at 850 degrees Fahrenheit. So this oven is, it's called a, um, it's basically, a, it's a gas oven. Uh, it has the ability to, if we shut the gas off, we could cook the pizza with wood as well. Uh, wood is fine. Uh, it's not our favorite uh, fuel for cooking pizza. I know that there's people that have these, this huge belief that you know it has to be with wood uh, because it tastes in the pizza. And there's a few things that you need to understand. First is the 60 seconds that your pizza is baking, there's no way that that smokiness is going to permeate your pizza. You do that like if you're smoking salmon or if you're smoking you know, uh, pork or if you're smoking ribs, it takes a lot longer for that flavor to really take on uh, the food. So it's, it's not, you're not really tasting that smoke in your pizza. Uh, you're smelling it in the air and that's a different story. It's, it smells good, but it's not something that is actually in the actual pizza. Uh, wood fuel is actually also not environmentally friendly at all. Uh, every time, I mean, how many trees have to be chopped for this to happen? So we use natural gas, which is a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, and the good thing about gas is that it has a thermostat. I can always have 850 degrees Fahrenheit. With wood, you know, it's, it's this thing that you always have to babysit constantly, constantly, and it gets all the soot. And, you know, it, it does, that does become easy at some point if you're a pizzaiolo. Uh, but it's the same way as riding a unicycle becomes easy at some point. You can't start riding a unicycle perfectly on your first shot. It's going to take a long time before that unicycle becomes easy to ride. Same here. I like consistency. If I have a, a big a pizzeria or a restaurant where I'm selling pizza, I want to make sure that those pizzas are going to come out the same all the time. Okay. And I want to make sure that there's no soot in my pizzas. I want to make sure that there's, there's nothing in there that's not supposed to be. So having said that, you can also master the art of cooking with fire. And that's also great. Because, you know, you could, there's many ways to do this. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's make pizza. So this is our dough. I'm using this uh, durum flour, durum semolina, which is a little bit coarser than regular flour, but it's good because it acts almost like ball bearings on the dough. So it keeps it from sticking, but it also doesn't stick too much to the dough. Uh, so it's, it's a good like uh, way to keep your dough from sticking and stuff. So we're gonna put some on our work area here, some on our dough, pick it up, a little more on top, and we're gonna start shaping it. When I shape this dough, we don't go like this. We're not playing the piano. We have to be very delicate and deliberate. So I'm gonna be using this part of my hand, arched, so I can gently push down from the bottom to the top. I'm trying to push the bubbles to the rim, right? So if we have bubbles here, I'm doing this to get them out to the rim. And I'm making sure that I'm keeping that rim in place. We rotate again, we do it on the other side. So we have an even shape. This shouldn't have to be a perfect circle. I mean, it is pizza after all. You can try to make it as even as possible, but it's not, it's not necessary. The pastry chef in me always wanted to make a perfect disc, but I've, I've learned to kind of let it go with pizza because the time you spend fussing to try to get it perfectly round, it doesn't contribute to a better pizza, I think. So uh, sometimes you get these bubbles. Uh, the bubbles are, are good to have, but one, they're, they have a very thin membrane like this one. What I like to do is I like to pop it because what's going to happen, that very thin membrane is really going to char and burn too much in my oven. So there's various ways to pop it. You can use this, which is uh, a scribe, just pop it. You can also just pinch it. It's really, there's many ways to do it, but you want to just make sure that if you have a lot of them, you get rid of them. Okay. So once I'm about this size, there's many different ways to open it. So the, this is called a Neapolitan slap where you basically throw it and you use gravity 
and speed, this is done very quickly and doing it in slow motion uh, to get it bigger and to also uh, get rid of the flower. But you can also use the back of your hands to give a quarter turn. And as you can see, just in a few movements, I was able to open my pizza and have it ready for toppings, okay? So right now it's at about 10 inches. I don't want it to get as big as it's going to bake, okay? So because from here, I'm gonna pull it onto the peel and, and we can stretch it to make it a little bit bigger, okay? So I'm gonna pop another bubble here. Next, we're gonna apply the sauce. Sauce uh, for Neapolitan pizza is very loose. It's very wet because it's going in a very hot oven. Uh, it's something you don't want to use like a New York style tomato sauce that's too thick because it might burn. Uh, so we want to use something like this. And there's different ways to apply it. This is called a spoodle, which is a spoon with a flat bottom. So I could put the sauce on, spin it a couple of times with the flat base and it distributes it evenly. Not too much, not too little, just enough so that I'm covering the bottom of the pizza, but we don't want to have any like exposed parts to the actual dough, but not too much that I can't see any of the dough underneath. Okay, so it, it's you're gonna have to finesse it a little bit. Then we're gonna put basil. I like to put the basil on first uh, because I don't really like the taste of really dark or burnt basil. That's just a personal preference. You could put it on top or after it bakes, but I like to put it directly on the sauce so that it kind of melts with the sauce. Uh, I don't put too huge of a piece. I like to have smaller pieces so that every slice has a little bit of basil. So we put it all the way on the outside. We put some in the middle, okay? And then the cheese, the cheese is very important. Uh, this is fresh mozzarella. Uh, so there's many, there's the Fior de Latte, which is what its name is, which is your basic cow's milk, fresh mozzarella. Uh, you can also uh, get mozzarella di bufala, which is made with buffalo milk. It's a little bit more expensive. You know, different pizzaiolos have different preferences. Some like to use one, some like to use the other. Uh, it really is a matter of personal taste. The mozzarella buffalo is a lot more expensive, just FYI. So with this cheese, what we do is we cut it. Uh, we cut it to more or less the same size and then we let it drain overnight so it's not super wet. Uh, and then we bring it up to room temperature. Same for the sauce. You don't want the sauce to be cold or the cheese to be cold. You want them to be about room temperature because if it's going on cold on the pizza, it's gonna, mess with how the pizza bakes and it's not gonna be, uh, you know, in this optimal baking temperature. So we bring it to room temperature. I like to put the cheese on top of the basil, again, to sort of protect it. We drain the cheese so that we don't have like a puddle sloshing around the center of our pizza. It's, uh, to me, that's not a sign of quality. That's a sign of uh, poorly executed pizza. Um, I, I think it should be a little bit wet, but not to the point where there's this like, you know, the, the toppies are kind of floating around the liquor, okay? And then we're gonna apply the olive oil. It's different ways to apply it. This is a classic way with the cruet. It takes a little more practice. You can also use a squeeze bottle. You know, it, it, it has the same, the same effect. If you want to do, you have an open kitchen, this is probably the better thing to use. And we wanna make sure that we're not putting too much on, just a quick spiral of the oil. Okay, so now we're ready to bake. We're gonna use this peel, super thin, holes on the bottom so that when I slide my pizza on, some of that excess flour is gonna fall off. Some people like to slide the peel under the pizza. I like to pull it on. I like it because this way I can restretch it here. And I'm not like messing with the toppings too much. They won't move around too much. So here you can just stretch it a little bit more. Okay, and now we're ready to go in the oven. At 60 to 90 seconds. 90 is like the max, okay? I like to wait until I see just a tiny little bit of color on the rim. When I see like the first sign of leoparding, the first sign of browning, that's my sign to start spinning it. And I switch to this peel, which is called the spinning peel. Uh, and it's called that because it helps you spin. It's a little smaller. But what we do is once we see some color, there it is. We go underneath very carefully and we start spinning, right? We do quarter turns. You can leave it in. You can do two or three pizzas at a time if you want. If you're really good at it, actually. 
I like to spin frequently to get a really nice even bake. A little bit more. Doming it to get it like just that last few seconds, just to get it properly evenly baked. But well, there we go. To me, it never gets sold to make this sort of pizza. See, we have, I like to show it off only because it's a beautiful pizza, but you see you have all of this baked. The cheese shouldn't brown really. It's, that's more like a New York style. With this sort of pizza, you wanna make sure that the cheese barely browns. You're good to go in four minutes. Actually in two minutes is technically when you're supposed to eat it. To me, that's a personal pizza. That's one that I would eat by myself completely. So this is the end of the tour. We're gonna to turn the oven off. Nice and quiet. Um, and I am now, we're at the end of the tour. I am now ready to uh, take your questions. Wonderful. Well, Chef, my, my mind is blown and the pizza looks fabulous. So thank you so much for that incredible tour. Um, thank you. We, we have had some great questions coming in. Uh, some of them in advance and some of them through the Q&A. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. the first question is, what training you might recommend for those who are interested in moving from the kitchen into a career in food science such as yours? Uh, so there is a, a, a career that's called culinology, or, uh, and it, it basically what it is, it's a, what I find to be like the perfect combination of learning food science and cooking. Uh, because if you look at many food scientists, uh, they don't know how to cook. They know the science. They really focus on like this one starch and, uh, or for example, but um, the, and then you have a chef, which may be a very good cook, but maybe they're not understanding what's happening to like a very deep degree. But uh, clinology allows you to do those two things together. And I know uh, I, my, the last, uh, you know, um, when I left the Culinary Institute of America, I was teaching, uh, they have a bachelor's degree in food science now. Uh, which is a, a two-year program plus the two years of, you know, associate's degree in cooking. Uh, so it's a fantastic program. Uh, also, you can look at more resources with the Research Chefs Association. It's called it's RCA. Uh, we do a lot of work with them as well. But that's how I, I would recommend, like, what is the closest, most direct path uh, to basically get more involved and get more into, like, the, the, the research part of, of cooking. Okay, well, great. We have a couple of uh, technical questions that some of the chefs were asking during the tour. One, uh -huh. uh, this is kind of a twofer that we're, we'll, we'll do because it's about the same piece of equipment. They were wondering, um, does the quality of the produce matter um, for the overall intensity of flavor when using the rotary extractor? Um, yeah, in a, in a way, yes. I mean, although look, we, we've got in like, the, the whole point was to you know, we got like the worst like winter tomatoes we could get, uh, the hardest, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Those, this is really awful tomatoes uh, to start our developing our recipe with it because it, it's, if it worked in the most extreme um, situation, it would work with better tomatoes, even better. So uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously you don't want to get anything that's moldy or spoiled or bad, but the longer you let it sit in there, the more moisture you evaporate, the better it's going to be. So the worse the tomato, the longer I would leave it in there to obtain the best results. Okay, great. And to follow up with that, uh, once you extract the essence from the food, does the crushed tomato still have flavor as well? The flavor stays in the crushed tomato. There we go. The liquid that comes out on the other end is just like, imagine a very poorly brewed tea mm -hmm. or like, watered down coffee it just it's not good and we actually don't use that we discard that clear liquid the crushed tomato part it just the the water that is basically watering down the flavor has been you know a lot of it has been extracted so we have this concentrated tomato paste left behind and that is what we use Great. Okay. One of the other questions that came in in advance was, um, are there, what, do, what do you feel might be the biggest misconceptions that you hear from chefs when it comes to baking bread or pizza? Is there something that you see over and over again um, that's a mistake? Well, 
the thing about bread and pizza is that these are uh, very old traditions, especially bread. And so there's a lot of folklore and lore and tradition that comes with that. Uh, it's not always true. Uh, you know, I think in bread, one of the biggest ones is that the older your sourdough starter is, the better. This is absolutely not true. Uh, it's not true because you, if you build a sourdough starter and it's looking nice and healthy two or three weeks after you started it, it'll make as good bread as something that is allegedly a hundred years old. And I always take, uh, you know, that, you know, when somebody says, oh, this start is a hundred years old, I always really take that with a grain of salt because there's no way to know if that is actually true. Uh, B, even if it was for that starter to have been perpetuated in the same way for a hundred years is nearly impossible. Flowers change, environments change. It goes from one house to another house, from one continent to another continent. Uh, and so the mixture of lactic acid bacteria and yeast is going to change really dramatically. Uh, and I doubt that it's been fed with the frequency that it needs to maintain that, that bio microbiological environment. So uh, if you want to start making bread, don't feel like you need to have this like really old sourdough starter to make good bread. You can start today and next month start making really good bread. With pizza, it was for me, I mean, one of the biggest ones. You know, pizza are feel very, people feel very strongly about the pizza. It's like, this is the best pizza and there's no other pizza. And it's very true in Naples where if you go to Naples, I, you know, wonderful pizzerias, but everybody's like, well, whatever is not made here is not pizza. This is pizza. So, uh, you know, again, there's, it, it really, it, there's a lot of like this tradition that, you know, fortunately we're not beheld to, uh, you know, it's not like we are going to like step all over it, but is Neapolitan pizza the only good pizza? There's so many good pizzas out there. Uh, and additionally, it was that whole like wood fire thing that it's like that, the, you know, it really drives me crazy to hear that the wood adds flavor to the pizza. It's impossible for that to happen in six seconds. And furthermore, if you, we took a picture of this, if you look at where the layer of smoke is in an oven, it's a good six inches above the oven floor. So even if in 60 seconds it was enough for the, the, the pizza to become flavored, it's never really touching the pizza. So there's this big gap between where the smoke is, where the pizza is. So, uh, you know, we, we, it's important to remark then that the fact is that we enter, if we enter a pizzeria where there's wood burning uh, pizza and we're smelling it in the air, that really contributes to the experience. It makes our mouth water. We're the only animals that actually go towards a fire, right? Can you think of any other animal that, would do that. Every animal sees fire and walk away. But for us, it's like we actually get closer to it. So it's, a, it's attractive to us. Um, and it, it makes it taste better probably because you're smelling it in the air, but it's not necessarily that the aroma that you're smelling is in your actual food. So use gas, save a tree. Fabulous. And um, several of the chefs were wondering if plant-based or and gluten-free recipes were also included in your books. Yeah, we have uh, in our bread book, and in our pizza book, there's gluten-free recipes. Uh, we uh, used some plant-based cheeses. Uh, vegan cheese is not there yet. We, we tested, I think, 20 different brands. The, uh, the best we could get was uh, an almond milk ricotta. It was actually really good. Uh, but everything else, like vegan cheeses, they don't melt, they don't brown, just kind of stay there no matter how hot they get. So it's kind of, it's a different experience. And so, you know, I'm sure that in a couple of years we'll have vegan cheese that melts properly. Uh, maybe somebody has figured it out already as we speak, but uh, I think that, uh, and you know, meat replacements, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, fake meat and so on and so forth. You can put that on a pizza. It's not gonna jump out of the oven. Uh, it's gonna be different. And so like, there needs to be some, you know, need to manage your expectations when it comes to that. But uh, to me, it's not another question to put on pizza. It's just, it's going to be a different result. Great. Thank you. And the other question was, where do you find inspiration? <sighs> My God. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, it's, I, I don't want to, you know, say that it's come specifically from, you know, this place or that place, but it could be from anywhere. And I think that uh, it can come from even, you know, talking to somebody across the hall. We have we share our, 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 our kitchen with people, with microbiologists and chemists and even machinists. And so just talking to them normally can give you an idea. You know, sometimes there's things that you didn't know were possible until you speak to them. Uh, so, you know, seeds are planted in different parts. And I think that what's important about inspiration is that 
it's not something that you necessarily get immediately and it's really obvious and you act on it right away. Sometimes it's a conversation you remember from five years ago with somebody and it, it, you're able to basically bring that idea to fruition now with whatever environment you're in, you have a new piece of equipment and you can try it out. So it's, I think the biggest thing is to remember those things. That's why I always have a notebook with a pen and I always write these things down because you never know. So. Absolutely. Um, um, we know that a lot of culinary students watch the recordings as well as part of their classes uh, from mm -hmm. the ECF webinar series. And I'm wondering, uh, we received an email from an educator wondering if you have an advice for the next generation of chefs who may be concerned coming into the industry, obviously, after what has happened during COVID-19. Yeah, well, I think hopefully we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, our industry has been devastated. Um, and there are going to be many restaurants that just don't open up again. But it doesn't mean that restaurants aren't going to open up again. It might not be the same restaurant. There's going to be other restaurants. So, uh, you know, on that note, I think that the most important thing that needs to change in our restaurants is the restaurant environment. Um, I think that the customer is fine. And, you know, the customer has always had an enjoyable experience in our establishments. But what about those that work in the kitchens? And I think that we really need to make do a lot of work on making sure that our chefs and our cooks and our sous chefs and the dishwasher work in an environment that is healthy. I mean, I came up through very unhealthy kitchen environments. It, it, I mean, it was like whatever Anthony Bourdain wrote about, that was where I worked. Um, and so obviously that is not healthy. That is not something that I would say, you know, you definitely want to shoot for that. We want to shoot for people where there's going to be a, an enjoyable work environment where people work hard, they're respected, um, and there's this mental health issue, right? I mean, there's a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol that happen in, in kitchen environments, uh, a lot of disrespect, a lot of like talking trash, a lot. There's a lot of that that I think needs to end. So my first suggestion is create that environment or find an environment where that is actually nurtured and actually happens. And once we have that, we're going to have a great restaurant. Excellent advice, um, for sure. Thank you. Um, before I read some of our closing remarks, I'm wondering if there's any last or final thoughts that you would like to share with the ACF community of chefs. Well, I hadn't thought about it, <laughs> uh, but I think that uh, you know, I think that something that's very important for just chefs in general is that you know, that having an openness to learning and understanding because it can come from anywhere. Uh, and I think that the more we're willing to learn from anybody, even if they have less experience than us, even if they know less or they, we outrank them, you can learn from anybody. Uh, and not doing so is to be a missed opportunity. So uh, I think having an openness to learning new things and new techniques, no matter how old you are, is gonna be it's super important. I mean, I, I don't think I know much yet. And I think that there's still much to, to research and much to do. Um, the more, answers, uh, questions you get answered, the more questions come up. And so I think that it's invaluable to have that sort of curiosity uh, for the future. Wonderful. Well, we can't thank you enough for sharing and for giving us this opportunity to tour the Modernist Cuisine Lab. Just absolutely amazing. We'll certainly hope to see you again soon in a huge virtual round of applause as we, as we thank Chef Magoya and the Modernist Cuisine team for showing us their amazing facility and for sharing such an insightful presentation. We um, will look forward to hopefully seeing you again and thank you to the ACF community of culinary professionals for tuning in today. ACF wants to hear from you, so we will be sending you a survey to hear how you felt about the presentation today and what else you would like to learn about. So please complete that in order to earn your one hour of continuing education hours as well. We hope that you'll join us on our next webinar, April 20th, as we'll welcome three chefs to demonstrate cannabis infused drinks and cocktails, as well as on April 22nd, when we will have a fruit and vegetable carving skills demonstration for young chefs by Chef Stephen Beatty. For more inspiration for culinary news or to register for upcoming webinars, please visit our news hub, wearechefs.com. Of course, also please visit the Modernist Cuisine social media and links that I shared in the chat. And on behalf of ACF and ACF National Office, thank you again, Chef Magoya. Thank you, Modernist Cuisine. And thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you all soon. Have a great day.